Beat Blog. Hello and welcome to episode 34 of the Frog Beat Blog podcast. In this week's episode, I'm going to be talking about greening the Sahara. Um, I have to do a big... Why am I talking like this? I've got to do a big apology apology to the Jamaicans for last week's episode. Um, how Meghan Merkel is taming the royals. Um, Forest Green Rovers. I look at Lynx. And a few other things. Um, what I'm do- not doing in this week's episode, actually, I'll say it now, what I'm not doing is I'm not doing any of my regular features. <laughs> what is that, you ask? Whew, thank God for that. No, I just, Len's not in for a start. Len will be back next episode. <laughs> And I just, the things haven't happened for rich people doing good eco things or there's been no hunters killed recently for I Hope It Hurt. Um, and I just thought I'll give them a rest. I'll give those theme tunes a rest for a week. So I'm just going to talk about other things this week and I'll get back to it next week. I mean, I've not sold it very well here, have I? But anyway, listen on and I hope you enjoy. Right. Corrections and apologies. Um, Have you noticed I don't do corrections anymore? As I've said before, it takes too long um, because I make so many and each episode would just be apologising for the mistakes in the last episode. And anyway, I think it's part of the charm that I keep getting my worms wrong. (laughs) Um, And also, I do it live and quite frankly, I can't be arsed to do it all again. I've got a job. It's not like I'm a professional podcaster or anything. What's that you say? Oh, you noticed. Okay. Anyway, um, apologies because I played, I allowed this to be played on my show last week. Oh no, bad reggae from white guys. And I got an email from the Jamaican um, embassy and they were saying, Dear Mr Frogbit, um, we were aware of the cultural appropriation that was sweeping your nation with the strange vibration in the last episode. Um, Not only the music you stole, but the terrible Jamaican accents that you... I don't know which accent I'm doing now, but it's trying to be Jamaican, but the terrible Jamaican accents... Um, Yeah, I must apologise profusely there, but I'd like to say, in my defence, it wasn't me, all right? It was my guests. It was some posh, rich white kids who inadvertently took hash cakes instead of hash browns. So they came in um, high on that marijuana stuff that they're all trying these days. And I think it brought out their inner Jamaican. Um... Now, that, again, might be cultural stereotyping, but they were posh kids, so it might not be actually that bad a thing for them. But I am considering now whether to do random drug drug tests, Okay, From now on, if I get guests in, I might do random drug tests. Now, here's the thing. Here's the Babylon and ting. No, here's the thing. Um, Did you know reggae was only invented in the late 60s, early 70s? Yeah, up to then, they used to, in Jamaica, they used to dance to ska music. And what, this is the legend. The story is one hot summer, it was so hot. You know, scars, very upbeat, and j- and j- and j- and j- that kind of tempo. And it was so hot one summer that they thought, oh, bugger this for a lark, let's slow it down. So they started going, mm, j- and j- and j. so that was how reggae was invented by one long, hot summer. Well, this is the interesting thing, and I've never, been, I've never said this before, but I am older than reggae. Yeah, is anyone else out there in in like what was it about seventy? So if you were born up after nine before nineteen seventy or late nineteen sixty eight sixty nine, you are older than reggae. Um, 
Well, what surprised me, they hadn't done it before. You'd think culturally they, that beat might have been done, you know, and maybe not on electric guitars, because electric guitars sort of weren't invented till the 50s or so. Um, maybe it was done in another form, but it wasn't. So what? this is my theory, right? I've got a new theory that it was just getting hotter and hotter, and by the late 60s, they had to slow the music down. So maybe it was global warming. <laughs> Today, we find that reggae music has been caused by global warming. Now, imagine that, yeah, that reggae music caused by global warming. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. Other than I must apologise to Dillinger, that's the reggae artist, not the gangster. Clint Eastwood, again, the reggae artist, not the, um, not the famous guy, you know, the filmmaker and the, the film star. Um, Clint Eastwood and General Saint, um, who I also parodied, and I, I don't know any General Saints, Matthew, Mark, Luke, any of them. Any, Anyway, I'm going to stop there, but apologies to anyone that took cultural offence or oral offence by listening to those um, white boys play bad reggae. The wrong big blog. Right, um, Sahara Desert News. Um, apparently, constructing a wind and solar energy facility in the sands of the Sahara Desert could be a huge win for humanity. But a new study published in Science shows that doing so might actually make the desert not so desert-like anymore. The Sahara is dry and smooth and bright. Solar panels and the various hardware that comes with them are darker than the surrounding sound, sand. Meanwhile, wind turbines don't just passively generate power from winds causing them to spin, they can actually affect how the wind affects over large areas. Forecasting what might happen if a large-scale energy facility were to be built there, the researchers looked at all the different factors would affect the local climate, by calculating the changes and plugging them into a climate model, climate model, the team says the results show a dramatic increase in precipitation in the region. That's rain for all you thick twats. Um, as well as changes in temperature. So there you go. In Sahara Desert, if they actually built a load of um, wind turbines and solar panels there, because there's not a lot going on there. I mean, there, there are wildlife out there. But um, it would actually change it and green it. And that's an incredible story, isn't it? And I was reading the post um, on, under where it had been written and someone saying, yeah, but that would be too expensive. OK, um, imagine, for example, though, if the, the Americas stopped fighting the war in Afghanistan for a year and just weren't, turned around and said, hey, world, here's our present you. Here's our present to you. All those awful foreign policies over the past 50 years we've been doing, here it's on us. Enjoy all this free energy. We can afford it, you know. We've also just paid our richest people a trillion-dollar tax cut. Now we're going to help save the world. Um, here we are, we'll build all these solar panels and wind turbines for you, and world, you can have free energy. Now, it's quite amazing, isn't it, that such a scenario sounds ridiculous um, and it just shows what we've become conditioned to is how easy it would be for something like this to happen. And the world does have the resources to solve all the problems it faces. It just chooses not to. Um, you know, it chooses to rush headlong into extinction when we could to afford to save it. And it's mad, isn't it? It's absolutely mad. And talking of which, a calculation has been done that if we sh shifted to sustainability, if we shifted to a sustainable societies across the world, we would save $26 trillion, OK? Um, why aren't we doing it? By 2030, we would save $26 trillion. That's according to the most authoritative research to date is the amount of money humanity could save through a shift to global sustainable development. OK, that's a saving, yet yeah, it's a positive sum, not a negative sum. It's a saving, not a cost. Um, and the article says that might come as a surprise since decades of conservative and fossil fuel propaganda have made it conventional wisdom that cleaning up our act is expensive. Yeah, that is costs more than the status quo. It's the argument used every time. It's the argument used, OK, and it's wrong. OK, that argument is wrong. Um, you know... 
it would save the world money and it's always been false on a, on a time scale and it says here sooner or later humanity must live sustainable uh, sustainably or it won't go on living that's what it means any fundamental shift towards sustainability is enjoyed by all subs or subsequent generations of humans if there are any people left in the year 5000 the question of them whether the question of whether it was worth it to shift to sustainable practices will strike them as peculiar indeed yeah but there's always ways to make the shift look expensive in the short to medium term, especially since the prices of fuel, food and materials we use do not reflect their environmental damage. And they don't, do they? People say, oh, capitalism work. Well, capitalism doesn't work because it doesn't take into account the costs of pollution that these people are creating when they make their money with their factories. The public always and always ends up cleaning up the mess. And this example at the moment is of Florida, where you've got all those toxic algae blooms. Toxic algae blooms caused by all the nutrient, all the nitrates and the nutrients run off from the soil, which are put in there by chemicals by the huge chemical companies and the farmers. They run off the soil into the sea, create these toxic algae blooms, and guess who pays for it? The public pays for it to clear up. It is socialism for the rich. The rich always end up getting the public to pay for them whether it's things like environmental damage or whether it's the banking crisis us poor poorer people should i say yep yeah, and i know i'm not calling myself poor but compared to the rich the the, the one percent of rich people we end up paying for for their mistakes and um did that sound like angry i'm not being angry i was trying to be quite calm there but ran over Now, here's another interesting bit of news. It's about winter brain, OK? And they were doing some research for Alzheimer's and they found out, this is what it says, seasons by their very nature bring change, be it in the air temperature, the amount of daylight or the plants that are in bloom. These changes also affect humans, albeit in ways we're only starting to understand. Take, for example, how the seasons affect our cognition and what that means for those with Alzheimer's. What have I, I just forgot what I said there. No, what that means for those with Alzheimer's. Sorry, old joke. A study published in PLLOS Medicine investigated that question and found that cognition in seniors improves during summer and autumn and goes into comparative spiral in winter and spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, well, that's what it says in the article. And the thing is, I, I don't understand why that's the slightest bit of a surprise because we all close down in winter. Every creature, every plant, every tree does that. It's part of nature and we keep forgetting. We've got this human, except, human exceptionalism and we think we're different and we're not. We are just part of nature. Um, trees Trees go to sleep all winter, and I might have said this before. It's one reason, for example, why you couldn't have a miniature oak tree in a tub in your house. And people have tried it, and they die. And the reason why they die is that trees need to sleep. Need, tr trees need that environment where they can sleep, and they shut down all winter. And we must do to a certain extent, and I suppose it depends on the weather and the temperature, but I know definitely up here in the frozen north, we do. I don't function in anywhere near the same way in winter as I do in summer. Um, that's why the podcasts turn really rubbish, or even worse than they were. Anyway, so winter brain, we've all got it. The frog bit blog. Those wonderful English, British, is it English or British? British royals have been at it again. When I was flicking through the online newspapers, I came this across this headline. Royals stunned as Prince Harry skips Balmoral tradition for his wife. Meghan Markle, 37, and Prince Harry, 33. Ooh, an older woman. Rece Why do we have to know their ages? Anyway, recently, Meghan and Prince Harry recently visited Balmoral, the royal holiday home near Aberdeenshire, it is believed. However, it is said Prince Harry skipped a key royal tradition out of fear he would upset, in inverted commas, his wife. Why do they have to put that bit in inverted commas? Since this time, Meghan has accompanied Harry on royal engagements, most recently for a charity performance of Hamilton. However, it is believed there is one aspect of royal life she is not on board with. Prince Harry is said to have avoided a particular royal tradition while the pair visited Balmoral Castle this summer. 
Kate Middleton, Prince William were also there along with their children, according to some royal correspondent. However, judging from a tweet by Emily, it would seem Harry did not participate in the grouse hunt with his brother and his eldest nephew, Prince George V, over this period. They take a five-year-old kid out killing wild animals. Um, for fun, that's child abuse. They should be locked up. Um, anyway, Emily tweeted, Kate, William, George, Charlotte and Louise, Louis, Louis, I don't know, I don't care, are spending this weekend... Actually, she'll be posh, won't she? Kate, William, George, Charlotte, Charlotte and Louis are spending this weekend at Balmoral with Her Majesty. George was taken to his first grouse shoot on Friday by Kate with the Queen, Charles, Edward, Sophie, Louise and James and, uh, and all the other wankers joining them for lunch. Grouse hunting is known as a favourite pursuit of the royals, which they have practised for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, 300 years of practice, and they're still no good at it. It is known Meghan is a known animal rights advocate. I didn't know that, did you? So it would seem Harry's choice is moted by, by her. This is consistent with Harry's behaviour since he came engaged to Meghan last December. So, thanks, Americans. You've actually done some good in the world to make up for Trump. I mean, I know I'm putting you all in the same group here, and I'm only having a laugh. Um, but you've actually given us a princess who's actually more into animals than those bloodthirsty um, blood sport royals. Yeah, they don't set a good example to the rest of the country, do they? Anyway, good on you. Good on you, Meghan Markle, Merkel, whatever your name is. Right, well, you might remember last episode when I was talking to Dawn, we bought some chickens because it was our birthday. We didn't buy, well, we, we donated some money to get some rescued chickens. And just to let you know, they're looking great. They're getting their feathers back. They're actually responding to us. They're feeling, so I was going to say they're feeling more human, but obviously feeling more chicken. They've got a lot of space in the allotment to run about. And it's great to see them develop their personalities and not be so timid. Anyway, it was my birthday and my son bought me a book called Sapiens. I don't know if you've read it. I'm going to read it and then talk about it in other chapters. And it's about the history of mankind and it looks great. And I've been flicking through it and there's one... I'm going to read it except one chapter on animals and how we've treated animals throughout history because stuff like that... Um, it just makes me too sad and makes me angry and I don't want to be old and angry. Young and angry is OK, um, you know, but that's why I tend not to do much, too much negative stuff on animal cruelty because it sort of hurts too much to research this stuff. Um, and I think, like I said, it used to be OK being an angry young person and it motivated me to, to do stuff. But I don't want to be old and angry. I don't want to end up like that Alex Jones, you know him, that's um, banned from YouTube, banned from Twitter. He's sort of banned from everywhere these days. And if you don't know about him, or you're doing anyway, he's a right-wing conspiracy nutter that does things like spends his time blaming parents of school shootings for being crisis actors and is a big friend of Trump. And what's happened is that these crisis actors end up getting hassled. These, these are parents whose kids have been killed in school shootings and they get hassled from hundreds of conspiracy theories, theorists and they've had to go into hiding and all this sort of thing and it's absolutely disgusting, yeah? Anyway, he's an angry, he's an angry old man, a right-wing racist nutter, OK? Um... And I don't want to end up like him. And because he was all right when he was younger. You know, when he did that, we're walking through the air song um, for the snowman. I thought he was all right. Um, but now he's an angry old fella. And have you heard his latest one? <laughs> and blacks and communists and fags have got it in for me. I'm banned from everywhere and it's not really fair, you see. Darling, why are you singing a weird version of that Ali Jones song? I'm not. I'm singing a parody of Walking Through the Air by Alex Jones. You know that weird right-wing nutter who used to sing the Snowman song? 
Well, he makes sure that parents of dead school children have a horrible life on top of their grief now by doing all these weird conspiracy theories. Nice fella that he is. Darling, it was Alex Jones, the Welshman, that sang The Snowman. Oh, bloody hell. Oh, I'm very sorry about that, listeners. And so you bloody should be, my fan wee. Anyway, remember last episode I was talking about musical spaceships? I came up with this theory, because remember we were reading um, about the fact that they found out that music is lighter than um, lighter than gravity or yeah. something, so they could, in theory, if they concentrated music into a concentrated form, they could actually power spaceships. Mm. Well, yeah, well, this episode of a new musical theory that reggae is caused by climate change. Ooh. Ooh, I think you could have something there. Yeah, well, hear me out. Um, what it is is that you know um, people in the Caribbean used to listen to they used to listen to ska. They used to listen and play to ska. Used to play calypso, all quite up tempo music. All right, they must have played this throughout their entire history. Anyway, at some point in the late sixties, early seventies, it got that warm that they had to slow the ska down to do reggae music. So I think around about the end of the sixties, early seventies is when climate change is kicking in. Um, what do you think to that? I think that sounds right on, man. Thank you. And, it, and you had your own theory. We were sat in the garden, didn't you? And you came up with your own theory today. Do you want to tell us about that? Well, I wouldn't call it a theory as such, but um, as I was watching the butterflies flutter by, I thought, why are they called butterflies? What What is it? What have they got to do with um, butter? Uh, and they don't look much like flies. So um, my theory is that they used to be called Flutterbys. It wasn't just um, a childhood name. And, and that somebody one day just said, oh, I'm going to turn the B and the F round. Yeah, who was it? Who are you? Who yeah. were you? We want to know because we BFers. think, yeah, you, you what? You BFers. Yeah, you BFers because we prefer Flutterbys. Yes. We think they're nothing to do with butter and they're nothing they're to do with flies. flies. And they flutter by. So they should be called Flutterbys, flutter shouldn't they? Yes. OK, um, that's all then. Say goodbye to the listeners. Bye-bye, listeners. And as a football result just in, Forest Green Rovers 4, Carbon Dioxide nil. Yep, I mentioned these a while back as the world's first vegan football club. Well, now they've gone vegan better. <laughs> that was my joke, by the way. Forest Green Novas have been named as the world's first UN-certified carbon-neutral football club. Gloucestershire-based League Two club have been powered by renewable energy and endorsed by the Vegan Society. They play in League Two and they've announced on Monday that they have become the world's first UN-certified carbon-neutral football club. They're based in the Gloucestershire town of Nelsworth. The club has signed up for United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change for the 2018-19 season. Um, the club says it became vegan as part of the huge environmental and animal, animal welfare impacts of livestock farming, as well as to improve player performance and give fans healthier, tastier food on match days. Um, the club is powered 100% green energy by Ecotricity, um, which is a company owned by its founder, um, Dale Vince, some of which is generated by solar panels on the stadium roof. The team plays on an organic pitch, which is cut by a solar-powered robot lawnmower. Ooh, solar-powered robot lawnmower. Very futuristic, eh? Um, and the rainwater that falls on the stands or on the pitch is recycled to minimise the club's use of mains water. Forest Green Rovers also has electric char car charging facilities at the stadium to encourage fans to travel um, to gain sustainably. The club was promoted to the Football League for the first time in its 129-year history last year and will start its second season in League Two, um, the fourth tier of professional football league in England next month. So good on you, Forest Green Rovers. Keep it up and let's hope more clubs out there follow your lead. Now, here's another interesting one. Um, I've been talking recently about all the psilocybin research. You know, psilocybin is the um, chemical that's naturally found in magic mushrooms and it's been used. I talked the other week about them giving it to people with terminal cancer and how it helps them cope with it. Um, here's another article. Silicon Valley geeks say it sharpens their thinking and enhances creativity. Other people say it lifts the fog of depression. 
A novel experiment launching the 3rd of September will investigate whether microdosing with LSD really does have benefits or whether it's all in the mind. What's the difference? Anyway, microdosing using psychedelic drugs, either LSD or magic mushrooms, is said to have become very popular, especially with people working in the Californian digital tech world, some of whom are said to take a tiny amount of one or more days a week as a part of their routine before heading to work. It's not for the psychedelic high, though. It's to make them more focused. Yeah, right. Anyway... Microdoses tend to use either tiny amounts of LSD, as little as one fifteenth of a tab, or of psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. The study is recruiting just those who use LSD because of the difficulty in disguising even ground-up mushrooms in a capsule. Okay, so they're doing research to find out whether it works, this idea of microdoser just taking a small amount of LSD, not so much that you get all weird and hippie, but just enough to enhance creativity. Now, this is interesting because they said people in Silicon Valley, so I imagine people at Google will also be dropping LSD, and this is what might happen. Hey, man. Hey, man. Not seen you on this bus before. New, new here? Yeah, man. My first day at Google. I'm a bit nervous, man. Google? Nice call, man. What are you gonna be doing there, man? I'm replacing the OK Google woman. What, man? The OK Google woman. You know, when you say OK Google in your phone, ask it a question and get a reply, well, that's my new job. You weren't kidding me, right? I always thought they used a computer for that, man. Well, so does everyone, man, but it's far cheaper with humans nowadays. So what happened to the woman, man? Woman, man, woman, man? You a Jordy, man, woman? She got sacked. Trump complained that all the Google searches were biased against him, so they made Google get rid of her and got me instead. You pro-Trump? No way, man. They just told me just to read out the answers from the encyclopedia. Keep it dead straight, man. Anyway, I read all you lot microdose here, man. So I should be okay. I just dropped some acid, man, before I got on the bus. Yeah, man. I microdose, man. Just had my 1.6 milligrams. 1.6? I've just took 16. Yeah, man, you must have misread the instructions, man. You've taken around 15 times the prescribed dose. Oh, no. Anyway, good luck, man. Thanks, man. I'm gonna need it. Next stop, Google headquarters. So, here's the booth where you sit. When you get an OK Google call, just flick through the encyclopedia, try and find an answer. If you can, just make shit up. But try not to be too mean to Trump supporters. <laughs> OK, man. Oh, I'm starting to feel a bit weird now, man. Oh God, I'm tripping. These walls are so smooth in this booth. They're starting to move. Oh my God, man. Um, okay, Google. Please tell me something positive about our wonderful president, Donald Trump. Oh shit, um, um, oh God, um. Donald Trump is, um, Donald Trump is unique. Oh, I like that. No one else in the universe, in the whole wide universe, is the same color as Donald Trump. Except the guy who used to play Tango Man in the orange drink advert. Hey, motherfucker. Tell me something else good about our president. I'm gonna get angry. Well, well, well. 
He has the most amazing hair, man. He's effing bald at the back, and it defies gravity at the front. It's effing hilarious. He's hilarious, and you must be an effing idiot if you support him. <laughs> Our president was right all along. You are biased against our wonderful leader, you commie bastards. Have a nice day, man. Fuck you, asshole. And that is exactly what happens at Google. From Big Blog. Right, well, that's all I've got time for. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Len will be back next episode, and maybe Dawn will, and, if, and my regular features. So um, have a good fortnight, and I'll see you soon. Bye! From Big Blog. From Big Blog. From Big Blog. From Big Blog.